Good morning. Uh, welcome to the uh, first session in our uh, breakout uh, tracks. Uh, this is the uh, track, the uh, people formerly known as the audience. Uh, this session is uh, rich media and participatory, participatory culture, experience of uh, YouTube and iTunes U in higher ed. Uh, my name is Mike Cubitt. Uh, I'm the director of Media Vision here at uh, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, very excited to have uh, joining me today uh, Brian Beverly, uh, my far left, the uh, senior digital technology analyst and project manager from Wright State University, and uh, Jerry D'Antonio, uh, director of systems integration and web technology from uh, WVIZ uh, PBS Idea Stream. So always, say, always excited to have our friends from IdeaStream join us here on campus. Uh, unfortunately, Bill Duff, who is uh, in the program, uh, could not uh, join us uh, today from, uh, from Apple. So I'm going to do my best to sort of fill in uh, just the content that uh, he was going to present to us today. Uh, should mention that we do have some representatives from uh, Apple here with us today. Actually, in the, in the far corner there, Megan, thanks, and Nick. Uh, they actually have some uh, information about uh, iTunes U, uh, if you'd like to uh, pick that up after the session. Um, some uh, housekeeping notes, we do have uh, evaluation uh, forms that we'd ask uh, you to fill those out for us. Uh, we are considering doing this again next year. We're really excited by the response that we've gotten, so we just need to sort of get a gauge of, of what you have found useful uh, through these sessions and plan accordingly for uh, for uh, next year. Uh, we're going to take about uh, 15 minutes or so to first take a look at uh, iTunes U. Uh, and then we'll take uh, about the same amount of time uh, to take a look at uh, YouTube. And uh, really want to allow maybe about 10 to 15 minutes or so at the end of the session for Q&A or just a general conversation. Uh, try to make this, uh, this breakout session as useful as we can for you as, as our uh, audience. Uh, a couple of questions, though, before we get started. Uh, how many of you are currently our uh, iTunes uh, users? Great. Okay. And uh, how many are uh, regularly watch videos on YouTube? Great. Um, how many of you currently upload uh, content to either platform? Right. And how about as far as uh, commenting on, on uh, it's probably more on the YouTube side, actually add comments or post comments on the videos that you view online? Okay. Um, how many have access to their own iTunes U site or, or branded or enhanced YouTube channel? Good. Okay. So that uh, just kind of helps us gauge a little bit as far as the audience so we can, we can sort of... Uh, address our content accordingly. Okay, so as far as iTunes U, um, this is uh, a, a free service uh, for higher ed. Uh, it really utilizes the familiar sort of iTunes store uh, interface for organization distribution of, of content. Um, currently, there are over 300 uh, universities that are currently uh, posting content uh, to an iTunes U site. Um, and it's really Apple's intent for iTunes U to be a complement to universities' existing course management systems. Um, so that, that's an important uh, distinction, an important point about that. Um, once online or once the sites are, are provided, universities can customize the organization of the site uh, based on schools or management centers, whatever is appropriate for your institution. Um, and you can also take, care, uh, take advantage of existing authentication uh, systems uh, so that you can secure videos that you need to secure, you can open videos that you need to have open to the world as well. Um, so just as far as uh, context setting, sort of setting that up, I uh, thought I would go through that. Um, so to speak really more in depth um, about the experience uh, on an active iTunes site, uh, I'm going to ask, go ahead, and Brian uh, Beverly to, to share his experience uh, from uh, Wright State. Brian, thanks. Thank you, Michael. Can everybody hear me? Okay. <clears throat> How's that? A little better? A little closer. How's that? Good? Okay, we got <clears throat> my computer up. We're good to go. 
Uh, the first thing I would encourage you to do if you want to implement an iTunes U site uh, is, is download all the documentation that Apple provides on their website um, and read it several times. They provide uh, an administrator's guide as well as other guides, but I, I would really focus on the administrator's guide and really read that over thoroughly. Um, there's some general comments and suggestions in there, but it's very logically laid out. Um, and very helpful. So if you really put your head around those suggestions, it will help you out tremendously. The next thing I would encourage you to do is <clears throat> download a piece of freeware that a, a fellow, Rich Wolf, at uh, University of Illinois Chicago uh, made available um, called Woolamaloo. It's a Monty Python re reference, I guess. Um, but it helps you uh, tremendously with debugging your site when you're getting your access roles set up for user accounts, um, as well as uh, debugging your transfer script. Um, that'll be the, the major thing that you focus on when, <clears throat> when you're setting up the site in, initially. And I'll post a, a slide with all these URLs bigger at the end. On our site, <clears throat> we've got uh, a couple ways to access it uh, through web, web, <clears throat> web browsers or websites. Um, this one's the, the public entry page. Um, we, we've also provided access through our portal, uh, as well as uh, the web index on the Wright State web server. But on this site, uh, we've, we've got a link for the frequently asked questions. And I would encourage you to, to read over this. Um, we still need to, to lay this out a little more logically, but there's, there's a lot of information on here on technical requirements, uh, uh, teaching, different things like that. We've got a, a link on here to our request page, request form, uh, as well as uh, some information about uh, iPod recorders and microphones. So if I were to click on one of those two buttons, uh, I would be launched into iTunes. And uh, <clears throat> what I want to show you here, something you can download later, if I go into, let me go back, if I go into the welcome section and the about section within that, and then the campus and facilities tour course, and then click on the WSU iTunes U tab, you'll see the WSU visual iTunes U, or WSU Visual, uh, excuse me, WSU iTunes U Visual Sitemap uh, and the thanks and credits. Um, the sitemap has active links in it, um, it basically lays out the whole structure of the site. Um, what I did, let me pull it up for you. What I did uh, on the design of the site structure is. Um, based on the natural language philosophy of the semantic web. I don't know if uh, many folks are familiar with that mo movement uh, at all. Is anyone familiar with that much at all? No? <clears throat> it's basically a, a fancy word for natural language. So uh, if you organize things in a, with natural language instead of encoding everything so, so people have to try to discern what it is, uh, it's going to be a better user experience, in this case, for the student. So everything's been designed from the student perspective. Uh, you wouldn't see um, uh, specific departments maybe listed because students really don't care about that. They just care about the content. Uh, that does present some challenges as far as uh, access, uh, but not that, not that big a deal. Um, your uh, the administrative rights that you would or the roles you would give out to folks would be a little more complicated, but it's very easy to to set those up. You can give access to down to the tab level, course level, or according to their their role. So, another uh, file you can go and download from there is the the thanks and credits, and that, that kind of gives you an idea of how many different folks you'll have to have involved. Uh, it is really a university-wide commitment. You'll have to have IT folks, systems folks, uh, designers for creating the graphics, uh, maybe some folks in your PR department or communications and marketing. 
uh, and content creators. So I would encourage you to, to download those. Let me switch back here. Oops. Notice how I'm toggling back and forth between uh, my local iTunes and the iTunes store. And we've got these breadcrumbs across the top where we can navigate as well. So if I go, <clears throat> go back out to the front, basically I went into About, Campus and Facilities Tour, and the iTunes U tab. So if you want to check those out later. Um, another big con concern to think about is your naming conventions for the metadata. And the metadata is all the, the text that you see for the name and artist, things like that. So you want to have a consistent uh, display there. But the metadata is also important as far as keyword searches uh, or smart tabs. We've created a few smart tabs in some different areas. Go into the, the forms area of publications. Um, there's just tons of forms for a campus. So we've got these different, all these different tabs, admissions, athletics, computing, and so on and so forth. But I've made another tab at the front called All, uh, which basically takes a keyword uh, that I set up in, in the PDF files using Acrobat or Preview on the Mac. Um, and it, if it's got form in that keyword, then it automatically populates this tab. It feeds it from all these other tabs. So um, users have to go to one place, and they can get all those forms. They don't have to go to 10 different websites. Um, whenever we update it, if they've subscribed to it as a podcast, they, they get the new content automatically. You, uh, another point about uh, the, the metadata is you want to be concerned how that's going to look on the actual mobile device, the iPod or, or the iPhone. So you want to build it accordingly. You don't want it to be so long that it scrolls forever, things like that. Put more important information towards the front. And that's, a, <clears throat> that's about all I had, Michael. OK, great. Uh, just a couple of quick questions, uh, just to follow up, uh, Brian, on a couple of your points. So, so the. Um, can you give us an example, so as far as the semantic web approach, um, how that's made the content maybe a little more accessible to the students? So I go back here in publications and uh, <clears throat> categorical publications. Um, for instance, handbooks. You can see if you look at the artist, those are the different handbooks from different departments around the university. So, so the student can go to one place and get all those handbooks. They don't have to travel to all those different websites. Um, but we've also got links back to those websites also. Great. OK, good. And then your, um, so as you rolled out the site, what were, what, what did you identify as sort of the key stakeholders in the organization to include in, in the planning? Uh, really, we just worked that out uh, with our uh, distance learning team and, and our computing department, marketing department. Great. Mm -hmm. good. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, now we'll hear from uh, Jerry uh, D'Antonio, uh, who will share uh, from the experience at uh, WBIZ, PBS, uh, IdeaStream. Thanks. All right, <clears throat> how's that, can you hear me? I'm gonna take a slightly different approach than Brian. Um, obviously, they went to a tremendous amount of effort to greatly plan out that site and, and coordinate it and do a lot of other things. Our site came about almost on a whim. And although Apple won't give us um, comparative statistics, um, right now we've had our site up for about a little over a month, and we're tracking right now between 10 and 25,000 downloads a week. Um, if we go to the iTunes top downloads, we regularly have three or four items in the top 100. Um, interestingly, I was looking just before here, um, our good friends at WETA, which uh, in Washington are one of the, um, the biggest PBS stations around the country, and they've got this um, war content as the 55th download. We're here at 54 with um, a cupcake show and at 56 with an episode of Ideas. So the, the, uh, the, the response to our iTunes U site has been um, much more than we anticipated. And 
kind of surprising in some ways, but also makes us very happy. Um, but our iTunes site, we didn't set out necessarily to make an iTunes U site. Uh, about a, a little over a year ago, we started out to develop a new media strategy. Um, we spent a tremendous amount of time and energy not only developing that strategy, but also implementing it. Um, and much of that was uh, technology focused. The idea was we wanted to position ourselves to do things like this when the opportunities came about. And so I put our iTunes U site together in about a day and a half. And like I said, we're doing as many as 25,000 downloads a week, which um, considering the, the little amount of work it took and the fact that it updates daily automatically from our content management system makes it a zero maintenance solution, so we're definitely happy with that. So I'm gonna take a step back and talk about that strategy and, and where WVIZ, um, where WVIZ and WCPN idea stream, uh, where we're going as far as our new media um, and how this and also our YouTube page, which I'll talk about in a minute, came out of that strategy. Um, a little over a year ago when I started, um, we organization put together a, a, what we call our web strategy team. It better referred to as a new media team, but um, includes myself, uh, Tom Furness, our senior director of technology, um, senior director of content, Mark Smuckler, director of programming, Dave Kanzig, and internet producer, Joe Sheppa. And the five of us have worked directly for uh, Kit Jensen, our COO, to do a lot of benchmarking and do a lot of, of um, trend analysis and a lot of um, <clears throat> um, work to develop this strategy. And like I said, the iTunes use site came from that. So I did actually put together a brief PowerPoint, but here's my shameless plug. I didn't get a chance to work too much on the PowerPoint because today is the start of the 2008 WVIZ televised auction. And we created a new auction bidding system. So I highly encourage you, all of you, to go home this, tonight, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday and test out the new auction bidding system and bid liberally. <laughs> um, so I have. Earlier this year, I went to the um, uh, National Association of Broadcasters show, and or how do I start the slideshow here? <clears throat> and they had this big banner up on the wall of the Las Vegas Convention Center, and I thought the saying on it was great, and I wish I had taken a picture of it, but instead, I didn't, so I'm just gonna tell you what it said. So up on this big banner on the wall outside of the National Association of Broadcasters trade show, it said, content makes cool gadgets hot. The important thing there, and this really speaks a lot to our philosophy at IdeaStream, is content. iTunes U is great because there's good content. An iPod is great because you put good content on it. All right, IdeaStream has great content. Through our legacy of WVIZ, which is 40 plus years, WCPN, um, State House News Bureau, Ohio Government Telecommunications, we have a tremendous amount of great content. We're continuing to create that content every day. What we want to do is get that content to people where they're at, because we think that our content on an iPod is really hot. We think our content on, um, in YouTube is really hot. And so that's the sort of the approach that we have taken. So in developing our strategy, we developed a, a vision and, and a focus. Um, and this is really where we're going with new media. And as you'll see, this is why iTunes U and YouTube and potentially other um, things like Joomla and Hulu and so forth in the future will, um, or, actually, or excuse me, Juiced and Hulu and so forth might be part of our, our, our strategy. Um, we want our sites, our new media distribution to be dynamic, interactive, community and service oriented, content driven. Okay, we're about this content that we want to get to people as, as Lev said earlier this morning, get it to people where they want to have it, okay? It might be great to have it on our website, but if you happen to like, if you ride like me, I ride the bus up from Akron's um, quite frequently in the morning to work, I like having the content on my iPod. Some people like to go to YouTube. We wanna get our content to where you're at. And also, we wanna get away from the idea of individual internet developers at our organization. Our new philosophy is, if you work at IdeaStream, you are potentially an internet producer. Because if you have any kind of content, whether it be um, the you know, marketing content or membership content or any kind of information that you want to get to the public, you are the stakeholder, you should be able to get that to the web and we should put in place tools that will facilitate you getting that to the audience, whomever your audience may be. And our focus is be audience and community centric and view ourselves as a producer and a repository of the content. So what we did was in, in 
pursuing this, and, and, and these, these goals came about over a, a long period of time, um, like so over much research and so forth. And the way we, uh, we approach this from a technology standpoint is an aggressive pursuit of automation. 99% um, of our web content across all of our different web properties is now in content management system, in a content management system where it can be dynamically sent to any particular um, place we want to integrate with. Um, we use uh, content from our content management system is consumed by um, one community's one classroom um, initiative. Um, it's consumed by iTunes U. It's consumed by our website or displayed on our websites. Um, we put in on base automation for our audio and video production as well. As the audio and video files are generated on a daily and weekly basis from the television shows, using some very simple and sometimes free tools, I created drop boxes where the producers could put a completed um, uh, MPEG video file from a TV show or a completed WAV file from an audio recording, put it in a drop box and have it get converted to the appropriate format for iTunes, um, Flash for our website, for um, MP3 for audio and so forth, and move to the appropriate distribution server. So now the person who is creating the content can also get it on the web very easily with very little um, interaction from um, myself or, or Joe Sheppard or an internet producer or and, and necessarily a technical person. So earlier this year, so we, like I said, we've been aggressively pursuing this and with the goal of when opportunities like iTunes came up, being able to pursue them. And so when uh, I was in Los Angeles for the Integrated Media Association Conference earlier this year, I met Meg Fisher from iTunes U Beyond Campus, who was in, um, who was there talking to other public broadcasters. And we struck up a conversation, exchanged business cards, and when I got back to Cleveland, I said, we really need to pursue this because I happen to be a big fan of iTunes. I think it'd be good to be in there. And plus, the only other people in iTunes U from, from, uh, that were public broadcasters were the people that I like to call the usual suspects. Um, KQED San Francisco, WETA, um, WGBH Boston, and 13 New York. Those are all organizations that have very large staffs, very large budgets, and those are the people that, when companies like Apple want to deal with PBS and NPR, they go to those. I think we should be on that list. Um, Cleveland has a lot of great stuff. IdeaStream is, is, participates with a lot of great organizations in the area. And like I said, we've been aggressively pursuing this technology infrastructure to allow us to support this. So I said, I really want to pursue this. And the feedback was, sure, why not? You know, it, you know, you can do it pretty easily. I can generate it from content management so that we don't ha it'll update daily and we don't have to actively do anything for it why not put it in there? So like I said, over a weekend I, and a couple evenings, I put it together. I just got some of our, um, I got our, our graphics guy to put together some couple of graphics for me for the album covers, and I created the RSS feeds out of our content management system, connected it in there, and said, great. I said, even if we only get 100 downloads, it was worth the effort because we're positioned by those other people, those other organizations. And of course, we hit 18,000 downloads our first week. I actually had to go and put some, uh, um, I had not been monitoring these server logs for a video download server, so I had to start tracking that to verify. Um, so yeah, we've, we've gotten a tremendous amount of reach, and what people are, are, are downloading from us is, is interesting and sometimes surprising. Um, the way we pro decided to put this up here, so notice we have two, two areas up here, content by topic and uh, content by, by radio and television show. Um, I mentioned audience-centric, uh, and, and Brian uh, talked about this. Your content is only useful to people if they can find it. All right. So internally, we tend to look at content in terms of show. We have a, a team that produces the, um, the Round Noon radio show, a team that produces the Sound of Ideas radio show. We have teams that produce specials and so forth. But to the general public, they oftentimes don't view it in our content in terms of shows especially if that content happens to be in a subject area that they're interested in. If a person is interested in election coverage, and we are talking about the election on Fiegler and on Sound of Ideas and on News Depth, why should we not present all of that content from across those streams to that particular person? And with iTunes U, this is a national and potentially global audience. Our presumption was that people would not be coming to here as WVIZ viewers or WCPN listeners and therefore they wouldn't know the names of the shows. So we as an organization right now are, are tracking our content based upon 
Underneath the hood, we have as many, anywhere from 20 to 40 different categories we track our content under, depending upon who's creating it. But we have all that basically aggregated under f the six main topic areas. And the reasoning for those has to do with um, feedback back from our public through the listening project, um, grant funding, things of this nature. But the six main are arts and culture, economy and jobs, education, politics, government, health, and environment. So basically all I did was create RSS feeds that pooled from content that we had already made available on the web. Um, if you go to the WVIZ website, for example, you'll notice that we have, um, we have um, video on demand for all of our, our television shows, and that's in Flash. So on our server, we have high quality MPEG files that we can automate the conversion of to get them into other formats. I just basically created a Dropbox and copied everything over and let the server run for, for several hours. And I created the, the um, QuickTime versions for this, created RSS feeds, and like we said, we've had a tremendous response from people who, and about 90 some percent of the people who are doing downloads are not coming by clicking on a show link, they're clicking on something like the environment link and then seeing the audio and video content that we have available for that. Or they're searching through iTunes, coming up with a link that comes up under one of those topics and then getting that content. And arbitrarily, I separated it by audio and video for no other reason than because I wanted to just basically have you know, multiple tabs to separate the content. So given that positive response that we've had, and we've done no promotion of this. We've not put it in our program guide. We've not mentioned it on the air, radio, or television, nothing. I just basically took content. We already had to put it through there, and the response has been great. So we know that there are people out there who want to consume this content, want it in this environment, and so we consider it a success. And so now that that's, we've had that success, we're now looking at ways to expand that. Our educational services department that have a ton of tremendous content are now, I'm working with them to get some of their content converted and put in here. And we're gonna create a for the classroom section, which was just for the educational content. And additionally, under each of these topics like environment, I'm gonna create a for the classroom tab. Since this content's generated from our content management system, I'm not limited to putting one piece of content in one tab. I can cross index the content as many ways as I want. The idea will be that when a person comes to the environment, for example, if they're an educator or a student, they'll see a for the classroom tab and be able to access educational content. And then in the, on the, in the for the classroom page itself, we're gonna split that up based upon academic subject, language arts, math, science, and so forth. Um, Again, we are a content producer. We want to distribute as many ways as we can if there is an interest from people to have it in that manner, and if we can do it simply enough to justify the cost. If Apple had said, well, we'll let you put your content up there, but you have to upload it to us one piece at a time, and you have to create these pages manually, we would have said thanks, but no thanks. By creating that way for us to do it automatically, we put all this content in there and are now going to continue to pursue that, as well as any other um, similar technology or mediums in which we can distribute that content. Um, and our, our stated goal, although it won't happen anytime soon, our stated goal is to actually go through the entire archive of all radio and television shows ever produced by um, the Idea Stream um, sub-organizations and get them available on the web. Um, clearly, some of the archival stuff won't be happening soon because we, have, we actually have stuff on the big reel-to-reel -reel radio t um, tape that's not going to be consumed any, produced anytime soon. But eventually, everything that we have, we hope to be in here over the next several years. And moving forward, as we create new things, everything that is new does go into content management, does get displayed, presented over the web, will be presented through iTunes U, and again, any other partnerships that we um, um, form in the future. Great. Good. Great stuff, thanks, Jerry. Um, Victor, if we can go ahead and switch back over to my laptop, please. We'll spend a little bit of time talking about uh, YouTube. Um, just taking a quick look at uh, Case's uh, enhanced uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so basically, you have two, two options as a university uh, with YouTube. You can do either an enhanced uh, channel or a branded channel. Basically, the difference is, is basically this, the size of the upload and some of the tools that are available uh, to either do multiple FTP uploads and also there's difference with the size of the web interface. The size of the masthead in a, in a branded channel is larger than an enhanced channel. So, so sort of minor differences and just some of the conversations that we've had 
uh, with the folks from YouTube recently, they're, they're probably going to blur those lines even further and even considering um, eliminating the difference between them altogether. Uh, YouTube is also offered as a, as a free service uh, to universities. Um, really does extend the, the reach of the campus um, to a worldwide audience. I know our, our colleagues at uh, UC Berkeley uh, in the last uh, academic year saw a little over three million uh, views on the, the videos that are on their site as opposed to maybe 100,000 or so that was actually on their, their internal uh, campus facing site as well. Um, some of the uh, just best practices to share. Um, so for channel organization, obviously the, one of the differences between sort of YouTube and iTunes U is iTunes U can be set up in such a way that you can have multiple individuals within the campus upload content. Um, YouTube does not inherently sort of provide that ability unless you architect some solutions within your campus to be able to enable that. Um, content can be uploaded from a single point and there are some, there are some solutions to do that. Uh, obviously, uh, customizing uh, your channel design and sort of branding it appropriately for, for your institution um, is, is critical. Um, focusing on the quality um, and, and sort of testing on multiple devices is certainly, you know, an important thing, whether it's a, uh, an iPhone or an older uh, PC, um, just sort of playing with your, with your encoding parameters to make sure that you can best the, uh, get the best possible experience for, uh, for your users. Um, the importance of metadata, uh, both Brian and Jerry I know talked about this as far as the ability for uh, basically your audience to be able to find your content uh, is critical as well. So, so taking some time to really think through uh, those tags and the keywords that you choose uh, and how they relate to, to other videos that may be on uh, iTunes or, or YouTube as well. Um, Uploading content uh, regularly uh, is also a way to basically keep clients or keep users coming back to your site. Um, that's an important uh, thing to even pay attention as far as to what folks are watching, uh, uh, enlisting comments or accepting comments from, from folks as they watch, uh, provide some really valuable feedback on what really what the client community sees as valuable. So one of the things that we ran across when we launched our site was there was some concern about sort of how content is vetted and so sort of how will we as an institution sort of control the quality of the content that's on the site. What we've actually found is that the site actually vets the content itself. So if it's not valuable content to the community, they won't watch it and they won't share it. Uh, if it's great content, then it'll be shared. So just a, a, a good example, uh, you know, Lev was, was at a conference uh, was approached by a uh, base, I think it was down in Mexico, uh, was approached by a gentleman from Japan who the day before his brother-in-law sent him a link to a site that was just posted on Case's YouTube site a day earlier. So do you kind of see sort of globally how that connectivity worked? And that was actually I thought was a great example of sort of the power of these distributed platforms. Um, from, a, from a technical standpoint, uh, basically, you know, deciding a, the appropriate uh, approach for your institution for your featured video. So that's the video that basically launches on the site when, when it's first downloaded. Um, whether you want to do sort of most recent, that's an option. You can basically produce a piece uh, for your institution or multiple pieces that you can kind of uh, scroll through as, as uh, each time somebody downloads, that, uh, uh, downloads the site. Um, the, uh, the use of the comments and ratings and responses, as I mentioned, sharing, subscription, uh, branding is important. We spend actually uh, quite a bit of time, oddly enough, on, on a watermark or a bug that basically when we, when we encode our videos gets added. So if somebody actually takes that asset, links to it from within YouTube, and it shows up either in someone else's PowerPoint or on another website, it still carries the university branding. Uh, with it, so that that's an important uh, aspect or feature that we focused on. Um, Jerry, anything to add from? Because I know you, you guys have a lot of work that you've done in YouTube as well. Yeah, we, YouTube is just a, a, a tremendous service, but organizationally, we're we're less enamored with it um, than we were iTunes U. Um, it just doesn't. As many people as there are downloading from YouTube or excuse me, viewing on YouTube, and as popular as it is, it doesn't necessarily fit with our. Um, 
strategic model as, as well as we would like. Um, one of the, the main things is it does have to be manually managed. Like I said, with you know, with, with anything that goes into our content management system, we have, we have rules, we have procedures, we have all these controls and so forth, so that what goes in the content management system has gone through that, that vetting process, and then we can pull it through iTunes U. Because that becomes automatic, we don't have to invest time doing that. With YouTube, we have to manually upload these things to YouTube, which takes time, so there has to be a, a more of a payout. The other thing is, we did, when we're doing our research, we found out that people like short content off of YouTube, whereas for a lot of other services like iTunes U, there's long form content. Through iTunes U right now, all of our audios are roughly 50 minutes and all of our videos are roughly 25 minutes. With YouTube, the magic number I think was about eight minutes. Is that like you know, with, with, I know with the um, enhanced channel, you can get up to like a 300, 300 megabyte upload. So we actually have videos up there that are that are an hour, hour and a half long. Right. But I think the, the, the feedback we got was that people like to look at eight minute videos as right. opposed to hour videos. And so what we did is we actually, as far as I know, we're the only um, PBS station that has a, a branded YouTube site. I do know that, that PBS proper has a branded site as well. And we're kind of following the model they established is using it more for promotion. Uh, if you'll notice, we have these short videos from an episode of Applause. We have an eight minute, 51 second segment. Uh, so how do I get to your um, you search for under channels for WVIZ PBS with no. Um, case, I go to channel. It's uh, it's or you it's youtube.com slash case or and in fact any of the edu higher ed institutions. It's usually the name of the institution. With iTunes, you have that hierarchical way of getting there. You click on the iTunes U, you click on Beyond Campus. There's a PBS link and so forth. You're, you sort of have to find us. So, like I said, we're basically we're putting up promos. Uh, and primarily for our TV shows. Um, we're not really um, promoing our radio content here. And, and as an organization, we're trying to get rid of that distinction, view it all as content, um, because sometimes we'll have a piece of content that has a radio component and a television component and a web component. But here, we're just really focusing on trying to promo our television shows in hopes that somebody will, will see this, and then they will either be, come to our website to view the full length or um, become a viewer of the t television station. Um, another issue that we, we have with this is we are very sensitive to advertising. We are a public broadcaster, we're a nonprofit. At this time, we don't have any advertising on our, our websites, although we're looking at ways we can have underwriting on the websites and still fit with our mission and, and, and do what we do as a public broadcaster and as a, a nonprofit. When you have a video on YouTube, if somebody is watching it because they've got there to a search, they are going to put advertising around it. They're going to put content around it that YouTube feels is related content, and it may not be content that we necessarily feel is appropriate, or advertising that we necessarily feel is appropriate. And that's sort of the nature of some of these um, services. But again, that's why it was so important for us to develop a comprehensive strategy first Rather than saying, oh, gee, YouTube is great, let's throw stuff up there, and this thing is great, let's throw stuff up there. It's who are, who are we, who are we trying to be, and what are we trying to accomplish, and does this particular service allow us to meet those goals? And so with YouTube, as great and wonderful as a service as it is, we're not really aggressively pursuing a YouTube strategy beyond just some simple promoing because we really don't feel that where the technology and service is at right now really supports our, our strategy, and we ra would rather invest our efforts in, in things like iTunes U and so forth. If YouTube service does change in the future to allow us to control that advertising or have a, a, better, um, a better entry point or various other things, certainly we would then consider pursuing it um, more heavily. But like I said, right now it's just promos. Good. And I think that that's an important distinction even between from the use in higher ed. Um, so we found in, in, in our experience with the YouTube site, um, so it ran even without a public announcement over a weekend. You know, we basically didn't even tell anybody that we launched it. And we just basically had the site ready to go, put it up before we could do a formal announcement. And in about four days, we had about 4,000 hits on the site without even telling anybody about it. So, so I mean, from, from that perspective, you know, so there's the issue of, you know, control is good, but then access is also good. Um, so it really depends on, on the access to content. Um, the user community actually vets the content themselves and they sort of decide what they find valuable and, and what they don't. 
So we have a little bit of time left. I want to make sure that we allow enough time for Q&A. We do have a mic uh, since we're actually streaming this session. So if we could ask for you to, if you have a question, to wait for the microphone. We have one right here. Kyle. Sing. Um, we, we've kind of got the whole range of spectrums of, of different content delivery. We have case where it's entirely online. We have you that's entirely entirely an offline media. You, you sync it your iPod and can watch it. WVIZ seems to be taking both approaches. You've, you've got flash video that requires an online connection, and then you've got the iTunes U content, which can be synced. Do you have any feel for which is which is the quote right way to go? I mean, I know in my, in my mind, I'd rather have it on the iPod so I can watch it when I'm offline, but. And that's the key. I made the comment that we're, we're, focused, we're trying to focus on being audience centric. Um, if you want to know how your website works, don't ask the person sitting in the next office. They're inside your organization, they don't really know. Find out what the users want, what the audience wants. And what we're finding is the, the paradigm now is, in general, I want the content where I am at. And so we're try, what we're trying to do is, like I said, from a system standpoint, by using automation and content management and so forth, if we can distribute our content through multiple channels with very little effort, why not? You know, we partner with one community for their um, one classroom project, and most of the content that's available through there is also available through iTunes U, and the stuff that's not will be soon. Um, and, and it's also available on our website. So. Like I said, the, we weren't expecting the kind of response from the iTunes. And yeah, I wish I had compared our statistics because I'd like to know how um, other PBS stations are doing. And we're probably going to just ask them directly. But we're getting tens of thousands of downloads a week um, of stuff. And a lot of it's just old stuff that people randomly find from keywords. And yeah, so to me, if there's that interest, it is the right way to do it. Um, if people want to stream it off our website, that is the right way to do it for them. And as much as we can do that, as much as we can support that, we will. Uh, one is uh, for, for uh, iPhone, sometimes when I download something off of, it says not in that format. Um, do you have to change the format? Is that up to Apple to do that? Or how do you make sure you get it in that format? Yeah, you have to encode it, encode the audio or, or video so that it plays on that device. Uh, if you notice on our site, uh, we've got a lot of videos that are duplicated. One of them has on the metadata on the name of it, dash, space, iPod, to let you know it'll... You to, to do that. Okay. Right. They, they, publish, they publish guidelines, and then it's up to us to produce the, the format that meets those guidelines. Um, the way we're approaching that is we're in the, as part of our digital television build out, we have recently purchased a very high capacity archive system. And what we're going to do is start storing all of our stuff, all of our video and all of our audio assets in broadcast quality versions in the archive system so that that way through automation, if we need to convert that to say, if, if some other video format becomes the next, the big thing next year, we'll be able to then, either through scripting or through Dropbox or whatever, automate a conversion of that stuff from the broadcast quality to that version. So for iTunes, um, we, you, we just basically looked at the guidelines, picked something that we felt would be reasonable both for handheld delivery as well as viewing in, in iTunes itself, um, did one conversion of all the content and put it in there. Um, and so we're always, our hope is to be able to sort of roll with that and use whatever format is best simply by doing another conversion from the original um, high quality source. W one more quick one sure. that, that it's really interesting to me. So, so I'm going to start a new university that's called MIT Certification University. And I'm going to certify that you've taken the MIT classes and it's going to cost you one fiftieth of what it costs you at MIT. And if I'm a software company and you say you've completed it and I can see you're really good, what do I care whether you went to MIT or not? Does anybody, is that heartburn for anybody or is that go ahead and do it? It, it, it brings up a very interesting point. So we, we've actually been providing lecture capture on campus here for since 2003. And we're, we're actually currently working on a white paper that talks about the disruptive nature of lecture capture. So everything from impacting student attendance to classes to just the example that, that you provided and, and how will education sort of have to respond to that. Um, so we're finding some of our faculty are actually pre-recording their content, uh, telling the students to watch the content, and then when you come to class, we'll actually work on the homework. Because basically students say that they struggle with, con with basically homework 
not the content. They can find the content, whether it's reading the textbook, watching the lecture, Google searching, and, and basically sort of teaching themselves. So, that, so we're, we're um, having several faculty really kind of flipping uh, the way that they teach their class. So it, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out uh, you know, in, the, in the next several years. Um, probably have time for maybe one more question. Okay, I was just curious. You're storing uh, your archival video in a broadcast quality format. Are you dynamically converting it to whatever the user wants when they download? At this time, no. Uh, we've talked about that as a future possibility. Our automation's not at that level yet. Um, so, what we're, and again, that's why we chose one format for um, iTunes U as opposed to multiple formats. So what we did was, in that case, I, I have a, a server dedicated to doing these conversions. I basically had to write a script and create another Dropbox. Then we sort of did a drag and drop and walked away from it and let it churn and burn for a couple hours and then um, moved those converted videos out to the, uh, the distribution server. So you're going from your broadcast quality to one uh, quick time format? That's how I did it to get the content there originally, yes. But now, as far as a regular workflow moving forward, when the television show is done being produced in the edit suite and that, that, that broadcast quality version is now ready to be distributed through television and through the web and so forth, they could put it, the producer then can put it into one Dropbox, which will then both convert it to the multiple versions of Flash for the web, as well as the QuickTime version for iTunes U and move it to the appropriate place. Um, the idea is the less I have to do for them, the better it is for everybody. Can you tell us what software you're using to do your conversions? I'm actually using free software for that. I'm using a software called FFmpeg which is open source software which you can download and I do have to write I do have to script that so I have to write a short script that deals with a very arcane set of, of command line flags and we do have to do some experimentation on the audio bit rate and the video bit rate and very codecs and so forth but once we've done that experimentation and we like the result then I can just script that and then I use um, a very inexpensive software package called Watch Directory it costs about 170 bucks per server, and it, it allows you, it will monitor directories and allow you to um, do event-based tasks based upon that. It's very, very powerful software. The best thing you, you know, $180 is steel for what it will do for you. And by combining that, um, we use um, Lame to and, you know convert waves to MP3s and things like that. It can create a very, create a very powerful, very cost-effective. Um, transcoding solution. We are looking moving forward as part of the digital television build out to purchase a um, enterprise class transcoding solution. Um, those can be $10,000 or more, um, but they come with a lot of other, other features. So the nice thing is I was able to do it on the cheap to prove it, work out some of the kinks in the process, and now we were turning around saying, okay, clearly there's been a benefit to that, and now let's see about leveraging some capital to improve on that. Apple also has a a nice piece of software called Podcast Producer uh, on Leopard server that, that does that same thing with a, a nice GUI that's uh, not, not that as ex expensive. <clears throat> okay, well that, that's uh, all the time that we have for today. Certainly appreciate uh, Jerry and Brian uh, joining us today and, and uh, uh, your attendance as well. So thanks. Thank you.